big thanks to the Indian Academy of Science for having me here. It's a wonderful opportunity. And uh, to be honest, I have never given this presentation in front of scientists. I've given it in front of mathematicians and engineers. This is the first time in front of scientists. So I hope to learn something. Uh, so usually I work on various problems anchored around solid mechanics and fluid mechanics, coupled oftentimes with certain aspects of whatever little I know in electrochemical transport. Uh, so within that broad theme, uh, this is one area. Now, whenever we mention batteries, we primarily think of it uh, in terms of being an electrochemical device, which is why the word diffusion here is immediately relevant. But why growth and elasticity? So through this talk, using a mathematical framework, I hope to showcase some of the importance of these two aspects. Okay, so uh, as has been so wonderfully overviewed by Professor uh, Vijay Mohanan uh, in yesterday's symposium, as well as this morning by Professor Anandu Bhattacharji, uh, there's no denying the fact that there's a lot, lot of hope associated with lithium ion batteries, as well as there's a lot of challenges also. Now, uh, these challenges have uh, mostly to do with the fact uh, that engineers are very ambitious in scaling up the applications of these batteries from laptops and mobile phones to uh, electrical mobility issues as well as large scale uh, grid storage. Now, a big aspect of these challenges is to develop uh, or look for newer materials. But before we can look into newer materials, some traditional materials, uh, basic recap of the structure of the lithium ion battery. So, this is a very sanitized version of a lithium ion battery, it's not so simple actually. Uh, so, you basically have a sandwich structure. On the left hand side, you have one current collector. On the right hand side, you have a current collector. So, these are basically very thin metallic foils. I have depicted the anode on this side. Uh, this is the cathode side. Now, traditionally, the, the anode is made of graphite. And usually, the cathode is also is made of lithium cobalt oxide. And uh, you can have various salts of lithium as the electrolyte. Now, uh, my talk will be focused on the anode side, on one particle of the anode, because we have to note that this anode is not a monolithic structure. It's basically a mixture of the active material, which can be uh, graphite, of course, uh, or other material, as well as some conductive material and binder. What I will focus in this talk is on one particle of silicon. So why silicon? The most immediate uh, answer is that because it can take up more than 10 times the amount of lithium compared to graphite. But this very ability of silicon to take so much more lithium compared to graphite also poses the biggest engineering challenge associated with actually using it in a battery. Because when it takes up so much lithium, it swells up immensely by volume. Now, imagine you have tried to construct an anode using silicon. You have the rigid confinements of a battery. And this silicon is swelling up by more than 300% by volume. I mean, this thing will break apart. There's another subtle challenge associated with this volume expansion. Because uh, the diffusivity of lithium in silicon is finite, you can intuitively uh, understand that at the surface of silicon particle, the concentration of lithium will be high during the charging process. But in the inside part of the silicon particle, the concentration will be less. Now, because of this heterogeneity in concentration, the different parts of a single silicon particle will expand by different degrees. Because it is expanding by different degrees, there is some kind of kinematic incompatibility between the different parts, which leads to stresses. And these stresses can lead to fracture or some other kind of mechanical failure. So what is the way out? So material scientists and chemists have said that we should use nanostructured silicon particles. And it is true and it, is, it has been seen experimentally that if you use uh, 
like very small spherical particles or very small cylindrical particles, then the problem of fracture is mitigated to a large extent. Now, my issue is that suppose we do use these nanostructured particles and suppose we do not care about fracture anymore because it is not observed, is there any possibility of some other kind of mechanical failure? So, we will see that, but before that we have to understand a little bit about what is going on. So, this is the overview of the situation. As I had already mentioned, this is a schematic of my battery. I will be focusing on one particle. The lithium is going inside the silicon and making it expand in volume. So, this is the picture at the particle level. And as I have already mentioned, there is a big interplay of various factors going on even at one particle level. It is quite a complex issue. Now, even beyond this, because we have after all focused only on one particle, we need to be able to upscale the whole thing to the whole electrode level first and then to the battery level. How can we do that? So, there is something called homogenization methods by which we can go from the particle level to the electrode level, but there is a big, big challenge associated with it, which I will discuss at the very end. So, uh, even more sanitization because I want to develop a mathematical model. Uh, I am considering a cylindrical nanoparticle. Now, I will consider two cases. The first case on the left hand side shows a particle which does not feel too much constraint in the axial direction. On, the, on this right hand side, this is a, this is a case where there, uh, there is some kind of support here or some kind of obstruction in the axial direction which prevents it from going axially, which means that there is comparatively larger expansion in the radial direction compared to this case. And we have to understand that because everything is so very complicated and we are after all trying to develop a mathematical model, I will consider everything from now on to be axisymmetric so that the lithium infusion taking place through it is very much axisymmetric. All right. Uh, so, this is the general description of the model. I will not go into the mathematical details, but I will display some equations on the right hand side. If those things are familiar to you, you want to ask something, we can discuss this very much over coffee. Uh, so, these are the main things I want to discuss diffusion, stress, and plastic stress. Now, diffusion, as we all know, is intrinsically connected to the chemical potential. Now, this chemical potential uh, is again related to the concentration as well as to the stress. So, this is something we have to take into account. This is the new part. The stress is uh, influencing the chemical potential. Now, the stress itself, as I had already mentioned, is primarily generated because of the heterogeneity in the concentration. So, stress is related to the strain and the strain is due to the deformation and deformation, the primary driver behind this is the lithium, this is the heterogeneity in the lithium concentration. Now, over and above this, I have something devilishly difficult, plastic stretches. So, these plastic stretches are intrinsically connected to the stresses because if you remember something from your high school, so when the threshold level of stresses is increased, it goes into the plastic regime. So, uh, that is how it, these plastic stretches are of course, intrinsically connected to the deformation. So, uh, these are the main things I have to keep track of and for addressing the overall problem, I have this situation that for my first case, I need to set the net axial force on this thing to be 0 and the net axial displacement in this thing to be 0. So, these are the extra conditions I need to use. Okay. So, this is just a basic summary of the important equations. The first one is a diffusion equation. The only important thing to note there is that I have used the axisymmetric condition which reduces these gradients uh, to be dependent only on the radial direction. This is the mechanical equilibrium equation, but uh, I would just like to highlight for people who might be interested in the applied mechanics side of it. Uh, 
the superscript here is not just a decoration. Uh, it is basically the uh, first Piola theory of stresses because we are in the large deformation limit here. So, uh, we have to take care, I mean, the stresses are being referred to which geometry? Is it the reference configuration or is it the deformed configuration? To make life a little bit simpler, I am referring to the reference configuration, but all the results we have tracked in the deformed configuration. Uh, and for the plastic evolution, I am taking some kind of a visco viscoplastic dissipation. Uh, so, taking all of this into account, uh, we can find out the stresses not only for this kind of cylindrical geometry, but also for some kind of spherical geometry also. Now, I can plot the stresses and show you, but that would not be very interesting. It's very important, but it's not very interesting. So, our question was, how can we utilize the prediction of these stresses into something interesting and something important for battery design? So, one question we asked was, since we are considering cylindrical particles anyway, uh, what about buckling? So, of course, I went to the literature and tried to dig up some experimental evidence where this could be seen. So, as it turns out, nobody has studied buckling uh, from an experimental perspective, but there is this paper where they do not talk about buck buckling at all. There is not a single mention of the word buckling, but they show this nice figure. So, this is a silicon cylindrical particle. These are at different time instances. So, as lithium is being infused into it, it is trying to grow. But because there is this kind of an obstruction at the ends, it cannot grow in the axial direction and so it ends up buckling like this. Okay. So, uh, it is lucky that I got this thing. Uh, but this is just a picture, there is no data associated with it. Uh, if we have to talk about buckling, uh, if you are not from mechanical engineering, it is good to talk about it in a very simple way. So, let us suppose my pen is a cylindrical particle. Okay. Now, if my pen does not have a very large radius and it is quite long, I expect that it will buckle very easily. So, if I push down at its ends, I expect that it will buckle. So, the shorter and the fatter it is, it is safer against buckling. It is very intuitive to understand. The longer and thinner it is, it is more and more prone to buckling. Now, how does it all connect? with lithium diffusion. So, as it happens and as we have already seen, so, so when lithium is infusing into the cylindrical particle, the radius is also increasing because the volume is increasing. Now, as the radius increases, this thing, my cylindrical particle is becoming fatter. So, it is in a way becoming safer against buckling. But at the same time, what is happening is that because of the infusion of lithium, the Young's modulus is also becoming less. Now, Young's modulus becoming less is a rather dangerous situation for buckling because it is making effectively the cylindrical particle to be less stiff, effectively less stiff because of the infusion of lithium. So, there is some kind of a competition going on because of the decrease in Young's modulus and the increase in the radius. So, what we did was we accounted for all of this in a modified uh, Euler's buckling criteria and using that we found out some kind of a uh, of an estimate for the critical length. So, this blue line, so sorry, so in the x axis we have a non dimensional representation of the influx rate, how much lithium is uh, entering into it and on the y axis I have the L critical. So, L critical is basically the, the minimum length of the uh, cylindrical particle below which no matter what I do, it will buckle. Okay. But above it, it can buckle. Now, what I see is that it is the influence of the growing radius which is more important. There is a competition, no doubt, between the growing stresses and the growing radius, but it is the predominating influence of the growing radius. This blue line, this blue plot, that is incorporating only the influence of the growing radius while the red plot incorporates the effect of both the growing radius as well as the of the material due to decrease in Young's modulus. Uh, so, this is an interesting trend that we saw uh, and because I am running out of time, what I will do is I will just 
skip this next topic uh, which has to do with limiting growth and just uh, kind of end the technical discussion with this uh, last figure uh, which has to do with some kind of size dependence. So I had mentioned that uh, the Young's modulus decreases with concentration. We have already studied that. So recently we also studied the fact that if we keep on decreasing the radius, there is a dependence of the Young's modulus on the size beyond, beyond the threshold uh, level. So when we accounted for that and put it into our model, we found out that the percentage change in the critical length shows this interesting trend and we were able to fit this to some exponential thing. So we found that, we thought that this rather imp uh, interesting. Uh, I'm going to skip this limiting growth thing. Uh, now, everywhere I present, I present this thing with a hope that somebody will tell me something, uh, something rather informative. I can do this upscaling, as I had mentioned at the very beginning of my presentation, that I take all the information that I have from the particle level and go up to the whole uh, electrode level. I can do that using homogenization techniques, but I cheat a little bit. Meaning that I have my full set of equations and then I simplify it. Now, when I simplify it, I basically do uh, something which makes the physical meaning to be such that it is no longer silicon. It's a good model for carbon which does not expand so much volumetrically, it's not a very good model for silicon anymore. So my question is that if you know how to upscale using asymptotic homogenization but incorporating large strains, please tell me. Okay. Or if you have some colleague who knows, who, who is an expert in asymptotic homogenization, please tell me. Okay, I don't know how to do this. So this is a rather important question in mathematical modeling. So uh, these are some people who have uh, worked with me. These two students are really working very hard. Uh, so thank you very much. <laughs>